Hello and welcome to Farm Connections. I'm your host, Dan Hoffman. Today on Farm Connections, I meet with Tom Cotter on his farm to discuss the importance of cover crops and what it means to be a cover crop champion. Kent Tesey brings us his ag forecast, letting us know about 2016's record crop yields. I sit down for a conversation with entomologist Dr. Kenneth Osley to discuss insecticides and pest management. All here today on Farm Connections. Welcome to Farm Connections with your host, Dan Hoffman. Farm Connections, sponsored by Alcorn Clean Fuel, a farmer-owned cooperative in Claremont, Minnesota, produces ethanol, high-protein livestock feed, and corn oil, and beverage-grade carbon dioxide for resale to benefit its members and their communities. Absolute Energy, a locally owned facility, produces 115 million gallons of ethanol annually. Proudly supporting local economies in Iowa and Minnesota. Absolute Energy, adding value to the neighborhood. The Agricultural Utilization Research Institute. Collaborating with businesses and entrepreneurs to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products. You can learn more at AURI.org. Con Tile Supply, Leroy, Minnesota and New Hampton, Iowa since 1985, supplying the market with field drain tile products, dual wall, metal culvert, septic systems, PVC and plumbing supplies. We're with Tom Cotter in the middle of one of his fields and we're going to learn a little bit more about soil health and crop cover. Welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? Tom, what's going on around us? Well, we're staying in a field of cereal rye that we planted last year, about mid-September after a canning crop. And about 65 pounds of cereal rye, some four, five, six rapeseed, and some tillage rash. So you said canning crop. Peas, yes. corn? After following sweet corn is what, we, what we've been doing. Uh, we try and get peas also. That's not always a thing that we get, but sweet corn is pretty reliable. What's particularly challenging about sweet corn and then the crop following it? Well, you know, the, the big thing with canning crops is they need to get it when they need to get it. So it doesn't matter how much rain we get, they come in and if it rains three inches, it rains three inches, they still go through it and can, can mud up your field, but we're planting this cover crop to kind of negate that. Well, imagine a field that's ready to harvest and the company said we've got a high value crop, its condition is right as far as maturity, we've got to harvest it. They're going across it with a huge machine, and there's at least four tires, maybe more, and it's pushing down. What happens to the soil structure? Well, we're compacting that down, and we're uh, pretty much obliviating any root channels, worm channels that might have been there. And it's kind of wrecked for future use. Uh, the water infiltration will be terrible, and root development of the following cash crop will be pretty, pretty uh, resistant going through there. So with that in mind, why did you raise the sweet corn in the first place? Uh, to give me the possibilities of opening this up to putting a cover crop in here. Uh, I can get cover crops into regular corn and soybean fields, but you can get more variety and getting after a canning crop. So it sounds like you're talking a lot, a lot about crop rotations. Yes, yes. You're all about that? Yes. Why? Try because I don't, I don't like doing the same thing over and over. I like, I like variety, uh, the soil likes variety. Uh, just the corn soybean rotation, you know, it's, it, has, it has a plateau. And if I wanna break through that plateau, I feel like I need to get more stuff happening in the soil. And this cover crop is giving me that chance. So we go back to the last season, the sweet corn came off, yep. potentially some compaction with harvest. Take us through the processes of what happened next to get to this point. Well, I, I hate to fix that with tillage, but in some cases when it rains, you need to. So I have a Gandhi air box on top of my disc, and I come in, I lightly till the ground and take out any tracks, and then I'll plant my seed at the same time, and then I'll let the roots do my tillage for me for the rest of the year. So then you put the crop mix on, and about what time of year was that? Well, it's September 10th, 15th, right around there. And what happened in the winter? It kept growing. And what happened in January when it was a hard frost? It still was growing. You, you can come in, you, I can dig out that snow, 
and I can still have green rye growing underneath there. And it, it, pretty amazing. If I had cattle in this, if I could have had cattle on this field, I would love to get them out here. They would have loved it. We dug down in that soil pit, and I heard some people talking about soil stratification and different kinds of massing. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, that's kind of like when you go in there with your plow or your ripper and you're, and you're going the same level all the time and you're creating a zone where everything is getting smushed in right there. And you got great tillage depth above that, but getting through that is that hard spot. And that's where all your fertilizer might get to and stop. That's where my water is going to get to and stop. And that's why this cover crop will actually help with the water infiltration because it can get past that stratosphere and keep going down. And that's what we want. So we're piercing through that stratification. Yep. And the advantage is? Advantage is better root development the following year for your corn crop to get water. And, you know, come late August, when it's getting dry, my roots can get through that zone that much better. Uh, today, I think we in one pit where we didn't have a cover crop, we had about a three inch zone. And where we had cover crops one year, we had her down to about less than a half inch. And that's from a soil scientist digging that. So. I feel pretty good about it. Do you work with some soil team people to help you, you know, consult and do what you do? Ab absolutely. Uh, Miles Ellison in Freeborn County and Steve Lawler over here in Moore County. Uh, I bounce stuff off them. They get to try stuff on me. And then I also have friends, TJ Curtis and Mark Dilson, Chris Jensen, Tom Finnegan, that we all kind of work together and bounce ideas off. and. You know, it's much easier when you know someone. Uh, many years ago when I first started cover cropping, I didn't know anyone else was out there. So I kind of felt alone. Now you got networking with people and you can grow that much faster. What happens in the winter when you've got a root system holding the soil? Anything change as far as air quality? Uh, air quality depends on how much snow cover you have. You know, I know this, this early spring or late, late winter when we had a snowfall that came, uh, I had one farmer say, oh, is that going to kill my cover crop? And I said, well, no, now I'm going to catch that nitrogen that comes down in the snow and I can catch it with my plants and use that nitrogen. Kind of like an old adage of old farmers when they plant an oat field and get snow on it, that was the best thing to, you know, for that crop. And so now I'm, air quality wise, I'm catching stuff. Uh, I'm also keeping a lot more wildlife out here, a lot more bees, a lot more just the other day, we were driving home after when you guys were out here the other day. On the drive home, we had a big, huge eagle fly right down through one of our cover crop fields. And you don't see that very often, so that's pretty good air quality if you got that going on. Chances are eagle eye was getting dinner from the wildlife, <laughs> yes. right? Yeah, yeah, there's been a lot more wildlife. When you talked about this crop behind us, it looks tall and green, but I don't see soybeans. What happens come fall on this particular field? Well, actually right now the soybeans are popping through, but as this goes on, this will be terminated and I'll either roll it down flat and that will kill it mechanically or I can come in and spray it. And as this cover crop slowly dies down, my beans are coming up and in about three weeks, you'll, this field will be nice and brown. And another two weeks after that, you'll start seeing the green come up through the beans. And about late June, you'll see that switch and it'll, uh, it'll be amazing. Yeah. People driving by will be pretty amazed at how fast that can go from brown to green. And, and the green is there, the beans are growing. And as you lay this cereal rye grass down and it touches the soil, what happens to it? Well, as, as this cover crop, as the cover crop lays down, the soil life will start feeding on that and helping break that down. When I first started this, it took a while for this stuff to break down because my soil biology and soil life was not very active. Nowadays, I'm getting enough in here where my soil life is really going good and it breaks this stuff down pretty dang fast. Microorganisms? Yes. Yep. And yep. worms. In fact, we've seen uh, a friend of mine, TJ Curtis, has seen where corn stalks are getting pulled down into a wormhole. You know, that's pretty good tillage when it's happening year round. So as the worm goes through the soil profile, the root follows it? It's pulling, it's pulling the corn stalk like a leaf. Nice. So even like this residue, the worms can pull it down through there. How long have you been doing cover crops? Well. I think my dad had me plant a dwarf Essex rapeseed about 18 years ago. Didn't know it was even a cover crop. Uh, I kind of played with the back and forth. Noticed the difference and I've just been slowly playing with it, learning how to do the things. And for about the last five years, I've been a lot more steady and trying to keep it in certain all my fields as much as possible. 
So have you benchmarked any soil qualities like organic matter, water infiltration rate, and watched that change over those five years? I actually have a Sarah Grant strip where I've been doing the same tillage conventionally for the last 50 years. I have that in a spot where I've been cover cropping for three continuous or four continuous years. And so that's my benchmark. And I can actually invite farmers in and be able to look at that soil and see the difference firsthand. Instead of just, every time you get a soil sample, it's, you know, it's just paper you're looking at. I like to show them the actual product in the field. So that, that's my benchmark I use. What happens for yield expectations? Are they leveling out, are they going down, or are they going up with your system? Well, I've never been one of the guys that blows the yields off everyone. I'm always just kind of right in the middle of the pack. And every year that I plant a cover crop, my soybeans have either been in the top three or the best. So bean wise, it's been great for me. Last year, my strip till in the cover crop was two of the top ones were stripped in the cover crops and then one conventional that did just as good as those. So if I use less nitrogen. And what happens to the nitrogen that's applied to the field when you have a cover crop? Well, as this cover crop is dying, this will actually immobilize that nitrogen. So it will give a little uptake of nitrogen. Like right now, my beans don't need nitrogen. But later on in the year, it will. Well, that's when this, soy, this, when this rye crop is dying, it'll give that back to the ground in the soil life. And so those beans will actually get some nitrogen back then. So that'll help that. In the corn, I plan, I do strip till, and I put nitrogen right in the row. So as that corn seedling is growing, I have that nitrogen there. I'm not too worried about the cover crop sucking up nitrogen. And then later on in the year when the corn crop really needs it, that's when I get it back. So will nitrogen store and be less mobile with this system? Yes, because it's get, yep, I will not lose it to heavy rain because it's in the roots. It's getting pulled up into the plant. Tom, any advice for young farmers? Network with people. Get out, go, go meet people. These field days, there are some people from Monona here, some St. Charles they drove from two hours away. If you have a chance to go to a place and look at cover crops, go do it. Because that's, that's how you start and that's how you make friends and that's how you learn. Any advice for more seasoned farmers? Uh, don't get stuck in your ways. Sometimes we forget why we're doing tillage practices. And lots of times we just do it because that's what we've always done. Maybe there's situations where you could maybe reduce that tillage and maybe put a cover crop in it. It's, it's looking at everything from a different angle. And it's working for me and it's working for a lot of guys in southern Minnesota, all of Minnesota, and actually the rest of the country. Tom, thanks for sharing and also congratulations on being a cover crop champion. Thank you. Stay tuned for more Farm Connections. The 2016 crop year was quite remarkable in Minnesota, Iowa, and other Midwest states, with many states having record corn and soybean yields last year, based on the data released by the USDA National Ag Statistics Service, or NAS. A large number of counties in the region also recorded the highest ever crop yields in 2016. NAS estimated the 2016 corn yield in Minnesota at the record level of 193 bushels per acre, which exceeded the previous state record corn yield of 188 bushels per acre in 2015 and far surpassed the statewide corn yield of 156 bushels per acre in 2014. Minnesota had a total 2016 corn production of over 1.5 billion bushels compared to 1.4 billion bushels in a year earlier and 1.2 billion bushels in 2014. The 2016 average soybean yield in Minnesota was also estimated to be a record level at 52.5 bushels per acre, which best of the previous state record soybean yield of 50 bushels per acre in 2015 and was well above the 2014 statewide yield of 41.5 bushels per acre. Minnesota produced 394 million bushels of soybeans in 2016, compared to 377 million bushels a year earlier, and only 301 million bushels in 2014. 15 counties in Minnesota had 2016 average corn yields that exceeded 200 bushels per acre. 
Nicollet County had the highest average corn yield at 209 bushels an acre, followed by Faribault, Martin, Waseca, and Stevens County in west central Minnesota, all exceeding 204 bushels per acre. Nine counties in Minnesota had a 2016 average soybean yield that exceeded 60 bushels per acre. Led by Faribault County at 64 bushels per acre and followed by Olmsted, Rock, Nicollet, and Wabasha counties all above 61 bushels per acre. Iowa had an incredible 2016 statewide corn yield of 203 bushels per acre, which surpassed the previous record of 192 bushels per acre in 2015 by 6%. Based on the NAS estimates, Iowa produced over 2.7 billion bushels of corn in 2016, compared to just over 2.5 billion bushels in 2015. 60 of the 99 counties in Iowa had 2016 average corn yields that were above 200 bushels per acre, with 21 counties averaging over 210 bushels per acre. 49 counties, or nearly half the counties in Iowa, had average soybean yields above 60 bushels per acre in 2016, and all counties in Iowa averaged above 50 bushels per acre. Cherokee County had the highest 2016 average soybean yield in Iowa, becoming the first ever county to exceed 70 bushels per acre. Both Minnesota and Iowa achieved outstanding record corn and soybean yields in 2016, surpassing the previous record yields of 2015. The record crop yields in 2016 helped stabilize the struggling farm economy in many areas. The question going forward will be how well can farmers adjust financially if corn and soybean yields return closer to trendline yields for 2017. That's all for today. We'll be back next time with another report. We're at the event bar and grill Casson, Minnesota, with Dr. Ken Osley from the University of Minnesota. Welcome, Ken. Nice to see you again, Dan. So you're a guy that does some work with pests. Tell us about that. Well, I started in 1984, fresh out of grad school, working on corn and soybean insects and how to manage them in Minnesota. Well, do we manage pests or do they manage us? Well, we're usually in a game of adapting to what they're doing. Um, insects are notorious for being able to adjust to whatever we're doing and if they've got the capacity to adapt um, and develop resistance to tactics, uh, they'll do that. And so, for example, one of the insects I work with, uh, corn rootworm, in the course of my lifetime has developed resistance to the Initial insecticides, the chlorinated hydrocarbons, that went on and developed resistance to, of all things, crop rotation. And uh, more recently, it's developed resistance to transgenic traits in Bt corn. Well, crop rotation, that's interesting you mention that. That's a good management practice that the university and others have taught and farmers have embraced. How did that happen? So they're hosting in another plant besides corn? So the interesting developments on the uh, crop rotation front is that uh, northern corn rootworm and western corn rootworm have both developed different strategies to get around this very basic technique that was recognized in the 1880s and, and is the foundation of you know, an, an organic approach uh, to managing the pests. Basically, the eggs usually hatch the next year, so if you put a different crop there, they can't feed, they die. Um, so it, um, we figure it took about 20 to 25 years for northern corn rootworm to develop resistance uh, to crop rotation, and basically it did it by um, a fraction of the eggs hatched the second, third, or fourth year and so as we continued to throw rotation at the rootworms, they responded by, you know, selecting for those eggs that hatched late, uh, you know, two years or three years or four years. And so the next thing you knew, we were dealing with pot damage in fields where growers would say, we're doing everything right. You know, what's going on? So that was northern corn rootworm. Western corn rootworm, um, didn't have that variability in, in what we call diapause, uh, so it changed where it lays eggs. 
And so instead of laying eggs by corn, some of the western corn rootworms would lay their eggs in soybeans or small grains or even alfalfa. And basically, if you used enough crop rotation, you selected for those that were laying in soybean. And you, you help the, the changes happen. So it's our activities that are causing the insects to adapt and react. Well, your job's certainly interesting, but why is it important to our audience? Why do they care if we manage pests or not on our farms? Well, insects, weeds, diseases, all cause crop loss. Uh, so what that means is that they reduce the efficiency of crop production. Farmers end up wasting more inputs. Uh, the, they get less yield, and as a result, potentially, um, they're, you know, you have a market situation where you could end up with, um, you know the less production resulting in higher prices and, and in some cases the growers that aren't as efficient of course may end up going out of production and not farming anymore. So there, there are societal consequences in terms of availability of grain, the price of that grain, and then what it means in terms of the communities that the farmers are in. Ken, what would you recommend farmers do to scout and look and prevent things from happening or at least be aware? Well, we usually take what we call an integrated pest management approach to, to look to managing insects. So that means that uh, we try to tailor things to a farmer's operation and their way of operating, whether they're organic or conventional. Uh, or whether they're embracing the latest technology or farming like they were, you know, when I was growing up. It doesn't matter. We try to fit what tactics are available. Um, but selecting those tactics kind of based on what an individual field needs. Um, so, you know, it might be crop rotation or other cultural practices. It might be insecticides. Um, it might be crop host plant resistance, um, and we would throw BT traits into there or transgenic traits into that. Um, and in the background, we have natural control taking place. So that gets back to your question about scouting, um, and that's how we do, that's how we can tailor the management to what's happening in an individual field but just taking a look at what's there and what do we really need to do to manage those insects. Well, thank you for the work you do to help farmers, agriculture, and feeding us. Well, thank you, and working at this job has never been a challenge as far as interest because insects are so variable and adaptive and our technology to manage them keeps changing, so there's always something new on the table. Thanks for the good work you do, Dr. Osley. Thank you. Stay tuned for more on Farm Connections. It seems every year, ag weather experts make their own predictions for crop weather across the growing season. Mark Seeley, climatologist for the University of Minnesota, is no exception. He sees a warm and wet season very similar to the past several in Minnesota. That can create challenges in the areas of excessive rainfall, but also can be good news for soil moisture later on. As we go into the 2017 growing season, we're really sitting pretty as far as stored soil moisture goes, so we have that buffering capacity. If we do get into mid-season drought or mid-season dry periods of any extensive nature, that's gonna, be, that's gonna rescue us. Seeley says we're seeing an increase in both moisture and growing degree units in the upper Midwest, a trend that cannot be ignored. 17 of the last 20 growing seasons, we've seen above normal growing degree days. You know, the heat that we use to grow our crops, especially corn and soybean land. And that's expanded with latitude to the north so that 
full season hybrids or hybrids uh, that we formerly would have only confined to say the southern third of the state now actually more suitable given the climate conditions for uh, areas north. Same thing with uh, the different maturation categories for soybeans. Seeley says the climate trend is a very strong footprint, but there is no single easy explanation. I think the footprint of climate change is very measurable. The, ex the full explanation of it is still very complex. When you talk about growing season weather, there are two things that are certain. One, the weather is going to change, and number two, no two years are going to be the same. For farmers, it's a matter of being prepared and adapting to an ever-changing weather climate here in the United States. This is Lynn Kettleson reporting. In the years ahead, with a continued need to provide for our families and our communities, old standards like adaptability and teamwork will need to be married to a willingness to push boundaries and to continually try new things. Cultivation and sustainability and an increased awareness towards soil health will help to ensure that we continue the trend of being able to provide, not just for ourselves, but for future generations as well. I'm Dan Hoffman. Thanks for joining us here on Farm Connections.